Okay, good morning, everybody. So today we're going to introduce an actual new piece of physics again. One of the one of the last, not quite the last. We are almost at the end of the semester. Um, so we have uh, a new addition to our electromagnetic principles coming up. So today, um, we're going to introduce a new physics principle called Faraday's law. Um, and it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting one, uh, because it adds some complexities to, to some things we thought we, we understood. Um, and to start out with, what I'd like to do is, is sh attempt to show you a, a demonstration of something a little surprising. Um, and I'll try to try to show you a live one. I do have a video that's a, a backup if we need it. Um, so here I've got, uh, this is just a, a hollow copper tube. Um, solid copper it let's see if you can actually yeah you can see that it's hollow there's nothing inside it it's just a piece of copper pipe <clears throat> um and uh let's see here i'd like you to be able to see the whole thing okay so i have this is just a little piece of cylindrical metal it happens to have a hole in it i just grabbed something that was roughly the right size i think it used to be a part of some piece of furniture or something it's steel it's not a magnet it's not attracted to the tube if i drop it down the tube it falls out the other end fairly quickly as you'd expect you could see it flash when it went by <clears throat> however If uh, I have here a, a magnet, um, a reasonably strong magnet, not super strong, whose diameter is significantly smaller than the diameter of the copper tube, I'm just going to drop the magnet down the copper tube. <clears throat> so here goes. I'm dropping it now. And it finally came out. So let's do it one more time. I'm just going to drop it in. It's not touching the sides of the tube. I don't hear anything as I'm dropping it. And it finally came, comes out. So it falls very slowly inside this copper tube. And so the question is, what's going on? You know, why does that, why does that happen? And so our goal is by the end of the lecture, we should under, be able to explain uh, what's going on when we drop a magnet down a metal tube. It doesn't have to be copper. Um, mag copper is, of course, not magnetic, so that this magnet doesn't doesn't stick to the copper. There's no no interaction there. So it's not just that the tube, the magnets attracted to the tube. Um, and this would happen if the tube were aluminum. Also, it just has to be a, a metal tube. We don't want it to be steel because the magnet could be attracted to steel. So it's not that the, the magnet is attracted to the copper. There's something else going on here. And so our job is to figure out what's, what's happening. Um, so, and, and so I'm going to talk about something that doesn't necessarily seem like it's connected to that, but by the end of, end of our discussion here, it should be clear that it, that it is and why, why it's relevant. <clears throat> Um, 
So we know various ways at this point to make um, electric and magnetic fields, right? So let's let's just do a very quick review of of what we know about uh, electric and making electric and magnetic fields. So um, we could make kind of a table. We could we could say here's the kind of the field that we're we're interested in, um, what gets affected by it, what what the source is, and what gets affected by it. And we've made this table before. So we have electric fields. Um, in fact, let's do this in the other direction so we have more room. What they affect and source sources. So electric fields affect charges, other charges. And the source of an electric field can be a charge. Um, we have magnetic fields. They affect moving charges. I'm just going to write QV. And maybe we better... Um, call this Q2 so that we can say charge is Q1. <clears throat> so a moving charge is affected by a magnetic field made by some other moving charge. And what we're going to see today is that there's actually another way to make electric fields. So in addition to just a stationary charge or a slowly moving charge. Um, we're going to see that what another way to actually make an electric field is to have a time varying magnetic field. And it makes a very special pattern of electric field. So, um, so a time varying magnetic field has associated with it an electric field. In 1831, Michael Faraday in London and Joseph Henry in New York independently discovered electromagnetic induction. I am going to demonstrate electromagnetic induction with an experiment similar to the one that Michael Faraday performed. I have an ammeter here and I have three coils. I have a coil with one loop, 10 loops, and 100 loops. I also have a, a bar magnet, and I will start by connecting the single loop coil to the ammeter. I now have the single loop. This is an old style ammeter called a galvanometer, and it, it actually um, just has a needle that deflects to show a current coil connected to the ammeter and I'm going to move the bar magnet into and out of the, the coil. And if you watch very closely, you can see a slight deflection of the ammeter needle. Okay, so now let me connect the 10 loop coil. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to move the bar magnet in and out of the coil. Now you can see more movement of the needle. In fact, if I go very slowly, you see just a little bit of a deflection. And if I go quickly, you see a greater amount of deflection. Also, as the magnet is going in, the needle de deflects to the right. And as I pull the magnet out, it deflects to the left. But when the magnet isn't moving, there's no deflection indicating no current flowing. Okay, so when the magnetic field is changing going into the coil, there's a positive current flowing. When it's changing coming out of the coil, there's a negative current flowing. And now let me connect the 100 loop coil. And I'll start by moving the magnet in very slowly. You see a deflection to the right, pull it out to the left. And if I go in quickly, you see a much greater deflection. Okay, so the rate of change of the magnetic field affects the current also. 
<clears throat> okay, so that's the, the basic idea that, that a time varying magnetic field with no other power source around actually seems to generate um, an electric field. And it's an electric field of a very interesting, with a very interesting pattern. Um, so let's look at a, a V Python simulation of this. Okay, so this doesn't, this isn't a, this is a visualization, if you would like, of, of what we just saw. So here's a magnet, the, the uh, red end is north and the blue end is south. Um, and what's going to happen is the magnet is going to move to the right and then to the left and the right and then to the left. And, and as it does this, it, it should make a magnetic field everywhere in space and that magnetic field should be changing as we move the magnet, right? So we, we can see the magnetic field everywhere in space made by this, this magnet. We also see something else. If we focus on, let's only, con let's consider a slice of space here <clears throat> Um, a plane here, and we'll consider a, a circular region inside this particular plane. Now, this is going to be true in any plane we're interested in, but we're just picking one to look at it. Um, we find that the magnetic field due to the magnet, which is the, the cyan arrows, of course, gets bigger when the magnet gets closer. It gets smaller when the magnet moves far away. It gets bigger when we get closer. But as this magnetic field is changing, there is also an electric field associated with it that actually curls around in a circular pattern. Okay. And when the magnet pauses momentarily, that electric field goes to zero. Um, the direction of this field changes as uh, the direction of the magnet motion changes. And, um, and we could have made this, this circular region any radius we wanted. So we could have drawn a circle of us with a smaller radius and, and that we still would have gotten. So there's not just an electric field on this particular path. If we'd made a radius half as large, there was, there's an electric field there too. Okay, so what we're doing here is just visualizing the electric field on one particular circular path. So you might think this, okay, so the cyan arrows are magnetic field and the orange arrows are electric field, which is our usual convention, right? And the magnet, let's, let's go through it again. The magnet, of course, makes a magnetic field everywhere in space, okay? So, and as we, we move the magnet, ignore the circle for a minute, as we move the magnet, the magnetic field due to this, this magnet is, is everywhere in space, varying everywhere in space. What we're interested in, though, we're going to focus on is just the magnetic field inside, um, magnetic field inside this circle. And we've only sampled along a line here, but of course there's magnetic field all over it. So look at the cyan arrows as, as the magnetic field gets bigger or smaller, there is an electric, non-zero electric field sort of curling around in that region. But when the magnet momentarily comes to a stop, it's just oscillating sinusoidally in this. So when it comes to a stop, okay, then the electric field goes away and then it reverses direction. <clears throat> so what is this? Is this some kind of motional EMF? Well, it's not motional EMF because this electric field is there whether or not we have any, any charges there to be affected. Okay, so it's not a question of a charge moving in this magnetic field. There are no charges, but the electric field is still there. If we put a proton there, it would, it would feel a force. 
Furthermore, we can, we can do it a different way using a coil as a source of a magnetic field. You remember that a coil is also a magnetic dipole, right? Um, so if we, if we run, so here's a coil connected to a power supply and right now the current is zero amps. And so we don't, we're not seeing any magnetic field because there's no currents to make magnetic fields and we don't see any electric fields either. But as we turn up the current in the coil and this, this black arrow represents the direction of conventional current in this coil, um, then in, the coil makes a magnetic field everywhere. And if we turn down the current in the coil, it makes a change, mag, changing magnetic field everywhere. Um, but again, if we focus just just so we can see what's happening on one particular plane in space and one particular circular path in that plane, we see that as the magnetic field in the region inside that path is varying, we get this electric field. And then when the magnetic field is no longer varying with time, we don't get an electric field. So as long as the magnetic field is changing, we get this curly electric field and then when the magnetic field is no longer changing, uh, even if it's constant, that electric field disappears. No, so this is not, this is not motional EMF. Um, and again, the electric field is there whether there's, even though there are no charges there. So for this to be motional EMF, we'd have to have some a wire there moving in the field with mobile charges, but we're, we're observed this electric field is there even without a wire. Now in the demo, when the, the person was, was moving a magnet through a coil, um, a good way to detect an electric field is to see if it can drive a current. And so, um, so if you make a loop of wire and there's an electric field in it, a current will run. And if you connect that to an ammeter, um, then the ammeter will show that there's a current. And that's what we saw in that demo. But in fact, there was no power supply connected to that coil. So there was no battery to make surface charges to set up a field inside that wire. It was it was just a loop of wire connected to a, a meter that measures it and measures current. And so something else was making that electric field inside that wire that was driving that current. And that something was the time varying magnetic field. You saw, you saw that while the magnet was moving and therefore the, the magnitude and direction of the field was changing, you got a current and when magnet wasn't moving. But but you get exactly the same effect if you don't have a magnet and there's nothing physically moving. So if we just have a coil here, and again, this, this black arrow shows the direction and magnitude of the conventional current inside this coil. Um, so that when that's changing, we get this curly electric field here. But then when it stops, the electric field goes away. And it isn't a question of the magnitude of the magnetic field because here the current stops changing and we still actually have this fairly large magnetic field. It has to be a time varying magnetic field that, that drives that current. <clears throat> So this is really this is really a genuinely new thing, okay? We this this elect this curly electric field doesn't seem to be associated with any stationary charges. It's just associated it's associated with a time varying magnetic field. So we actually saw something that really was that should have been kind of surprising to you if if, if you were. Uh, if you were paying attention when we talked about potential difference, because remember we, we said that we found that the, the round trip potential difference around any, any, any path, any closed path had to be zero. And that meant that if we said that more formally, we'd say the integral of 
of minus E dot DL, which is the potential difference around some closed path around trip was zero. And the consequences of it not being zero would in fact be very interesting because if we had, say we take a circular path, so that's our path. Suppose that we were able to glue down charged particles in such a way that they made an electric field that actually had that curly pattern we saw, okay? So that everywhere we look on this path, not just at the places I'm drawing it, the electric field would be pointing in the same direction, same magnitude, <clears throat> okay? And so if we integrate E dot DL around this path, so we go, let's go this way. So our DLs would always be along the path. So E dot DL is just going to be equal to magnitude of E cosine of zero degrees. And so the integral around the path of E dot DL or minus E dot DL, if you like, is going to be the magnitude of E um, integral of DL. So it's going to be minus E times two pi R. Um, and that's definitely not zero. Well, if we could do that, we would actually be able to get something for nothing. Because suppose we put a proton here. Well, it would move in the direction of the electric field and pick up some energy, and then it would be going faster, and the electric, but, but the electric field would still be pointing in the direction of its motion. So it could keep going around, going faster and faster and faster, and get back to the starting place going much faster than it was originally. And it could do it again and again and again and keep gaining energy and keep gaining energy, and we'd get something for nothing. Um, and we tend to be. Uh, fairly suspicious of claims that one could do that. And in fact, there, in fact, that would, that would not conserve energy because there would be no energy input to the system. And so in fact, um, for, for stationary charges, you just can't do this. It's not a possibility. <clears throat> and yet what we're seeing here is that a time varying magnetic field actually can produce an electric field that curls around in exactly that kind of a pattern, a curly electric field. Um, and so this is really a new thing. And so we found that, um, so it, it's, First of all, it's, it has this, we call it, we say by shorthand, it's a curly electric field, a pattern. If you've taken calc in 3D, curl of a vector field is actually a thing. And so it has a non-zero curl. But informally, we also say it's a curly field just because it, it goes around in a circle that curls around in a way that you've seen magnetic fields do, but not electric fields. So, so this, this pattern of field is possible, but it can't be made by stationary charges. Um, does it violate conservation of energy? Well, we were putting energy into the system when we did those things. So in order to move the magnet to generate this field, you're having to do some work to move the magnet. To increase the current in a coil, you're having to put energy into the coil to increase the current in the coil. So there is an energy input to the system. So this so it doesn't actually um, so it doesn't actually violate conservation of energy. <clears throat> Second, what we saw so one electric field is curly. <clears throat> Um, and not made, so it can't be made 
made by charges. And so it's sometimes called a non-Coulomb electric field. Now it's just an electric field. It's just the same as any other electric field. It has the same effects and whatnot. So this really is more just an attribution to the source than it is anything else. Second, um, the, the magnitude, the, the electric field doesn't depend on, on B, it actually really depends on the rate of change of B. Um, and so we're going to have a, we're going to have a rule for direction. Um, and it turns out that, that the direction of the curly field, there is surprise, surprise, a right hand rule. <clears throat> And the rule is this, if you point your thumb in the direction of minus dB dt, then your fingers curl in direction of B. And the magnitude we'll see that it depends on the rate of change of magnetic field and the, the area inside our, our path. So it's gonna actually turn out to depend on magnetic flux, which is exactly like electric flux. So how do we figure out the direction of minus dB dt. So so what we're going to think about is discrete moments. So we're going to we're going to think about the direction of delta b over delta t, the, the change in magnetic field over some discrete time interval, right? So, and this is one of these cases where we're, we're subtracting vectors that are collinear. They're on the same line. So we have to actually be a little careful about how we do it. So consider the following situation. At time one, we have a magnetic field to the right. And at time two, the magnetic field has increased. So what's delta B? Well, delta B is just B2 minus B1, um, or rearranging, you get B1 plus delta B is equal to B2. Okay. So how do we subtract vectors graphically? Well, we put them tail to tail, right? Now that's gonna be awkward because they're on top of each other. So we're gonna to have to draw them close, but not exactly on top of each other. So we can see what we're doing. So there's B1, I'm gonna put them tail to tail. So here's B2 and then remember that the change goes from um, its final minus initial always. So it's going to go from the, the tip of B1 to the tip of B2. So that's going to be our delta B here in this case. Um, and so delta B is what you add to B1 to get B2, right? And so... So in this case, 
if we just divide by some the time interval delta t, we would get delta b over delta t, that's just a positive scalar, is to the right. And therefore, minus db dt is going to be to the left. Um, so we have uh, minus delta b over delta t would be to the left. So delta b is in the direction of change. Now, what if it, the field is decreasing? OK, let's just think about that. So t1, we have um, a big magnetic field. That way, at t2, it's gotten smaller. So what do we add to B1 to get B2? Well, here, let's move that label down here. To get add to B1 to get B2, we're going to just have to add that vector. So that's going to be delta B. So that means dB dt is to the left, so minus db dt is to the right. Now, what do we do with those directions? Well, if we point our thumb along the direction of minus db dt, then our fingers are going to curl around in the direction of the, the curly electric field. So if I point my thumb along the plus x direction here, in, in, in this case, then my fingers are going to curl around so that um, they're coming out of the page up here. <clears throat> so we're going to get an electric field out of the page here. And down below, if I sort of cur curl my fingertips around here so that my, my fingertips are touching the location where I want to know the field, that means the electric field would be going into the page there. Whereas in the situation above it with minus db dt in the minus x direction. If I point my thumb in the minus x direction, my fingers are going to curl around that way. So I would have an electric field going into the page here and coming out of the page there. And in front of the page, it's pointing down. And OK, so we're in, we're in 3D here. So we have a coordinate system and axes. <clears throat> Um, we have the south pole of a magnet on top and the north pole on the bottom. At time t1, it's on the minus y axis. And at time t2, it's gotten closer to the origin, but it's moved. So it's moving along the, the, the y axis, getting closer to the origin. Now, you have to take a couple of steps to decide what the direction of dpdt is. First, you have to decide what the direction of the magnetic field is. Then you have to decide the direction of the change. And then you have to put a minus sign in front of that. So there's about three steps here to get, to get this correct. So let's see if we can do that. So what's the direction of here, oh, we're only going to take the first step. We're going to say, what's the direction of delta B? OK, so we, do, we just have to get that far. So all we want is the direction of delta B. It really helps to draw these, these arrows. OK, so most of you correctly figured out that the magnetic field was going to be along the y-axis. Now the question is, which way is it pointing and which way is it changing? So there's more than one step. And we don't have very super close agreement here. Um, so the majority by a small amount says plus y. So let's 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 work it out and see how we get this. Okay, so initially we have a magnet. Um, 
that's uh, with the south pole pointing pointing up, and you do need to remember that that uh, for a magnet, magnet's a dipole, of course, and that the the magnetic field points away from the north end and toward the south end of the magnet. So, um, so initially, let's see here, at time T1, the magnetic field at the origin is, is pointing down. Um, we'll make it small. Let's redraw it over here. So at time T1, the magnetic field at the origin points down. At time T2, mag the magnet's gotten closer to the origin, so the magnetic field is still down, but it's bigger. So it's B1, B2. And so if we put these vectors tail to tail, so we can subtract them, B1, B2, um, we find that what we needed to add to, um, we needed to add to B1 to get to B2 is, is going to be our, Delta B. So, so delta B is in actually in the the negative y direction. Does that make sense? So now let's try one more where we take the next step. So we have a different situation here. We've got the north pole of the magnet pointing up, and the magnet is getting farther away from the origin. So it's close at time one and it's far away at time two. And now what we're asked for is actually the whole thing. So we're asked for, um, for, for minus dBdt here, the whole, the whole reasoning chain, okay? So let's see if we can do this one. So what's the direction of minus dB dt? OK, well, plus y and minus y are neck and neck. The majority does say plus y. Um, so let's see what the story is here. So the north pole of the magnet is, so the observation location is the origin. That's our observation location. And at the origin, the magnetic field due to this magnet is going to point away from the north pole. So it's in here, it's, it's going to be pointing up. And in time two, the magnet isn't as close. So the magnetic field got smaller. In fact, it probably got a lot smaller because it falls off like one over distance cubed, right? So we have B1, we have B2. What we need to add to B1 to get B2 is going to be a, a delta B down. And so, so delta B over delta T is down. So minus delta B over delta T is actually going to be up in the, the plus Y direction. <clears throat> now, what does this tell us about the electric field? Well, it tells us that in the region here of the path surrounding the origin, <clears throat> that the electric field, um, we can figure out the direction of the electric field by pointing our thumb along the direction of minus db dt. And by the way, some students are are tempted to invent things for themselves, like, well, if it's, you know, sort of some sort of bizarre checklist, like, well, if it's up, it gets smaller than it's this way, but if it's down, it gets, don't do that. Just draw the vectors and work it out, okay? It's actually much simpler. Um, 
so if we point our thumb in the direction of minus db dt, which is, is up, then our fingers of our right hand are going to curl around this way. So it looks like we would find electric fields in the, <coughs> excuse me, XZ plane, curling around in that, that sort of a pattern. Okay, now these things have magnitudes too. Um, so we could get the magnitude of delta B over delta T if we knew B1 and B2. But again, it's not, it's not just dB dT that matters. It's actually the, the rate of change of the magnetic field in the whole area inside our path. So implicitly when when i drew electric fields here our path was a a circular path here in the in the uh, xz plane if i take in a much a much bigger path out here in the xz plane um then we'd have probably a smaller field here on a bigger radius, so we have to we have to consider the whole the whole situation. And again, it's going to end up being proportional to the magnetic flux on this surface inside. Um, and so let's talk about let's talk about magnetic flux. Magnetic flux is, so we haven't talked about that yet. So magnetic flux is kind of a new idea, except that it's really similar to electric flux. So we can just write it as a phi magnetic, and that's equal to the, the sum of delta B dot N hat, over some surface surface area A. And of course, um, it's really going to be the integral of B dot N hat DA in general over the surface area uh, because that takes into account the possibility that the magnetic field is varying. Okay, But we can do it in discrete things too. Um, so let's just see if we can calculate a magnetic flux. Now this should be pretty familiar because Gauss's law. So here is, um, here's a rectangle in the XC plane. Uh, we have that magnetic, let's see. We have a magnetic field here through this rectangle uh, and it's uniform everywhere on this, this surface here. So here's our, here's our surface. What's the magnetic flux? Well, the first thing we have to do is get n hat, right? And so n hat is the normal. And, um, and so n hat is going to be the vector 0, 1, 0. And so b dot n hat is going to be 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 Tesla dot 0, 0.1, 0. And so clearly what we're doing here is we're just taking the component of the magnetic field that's, that's, that's parallel to n hat or perpendicular to the surface, OK? And that's, so that's just going to give us um, 0.5 times 0 is 0, 
point two times one is point two. Zero times zero is zero is zero point two Tesla. <clears throat> and so what's B dot N hat delta A? Well, now we have to multiply by the area. So we have 0.2 Tesla times the area, which is three meters times two meters, which is of course six meters squared. And so we're gonna get a 1.2 Tesla meters squared for the flux. Well, how do we use this? Well, what um, so what Faraday's law says, and we'll write it down two different ways, is that the integral around a cl closed a round trip trip integral of E dot DL, notice there's no minus sign here, actually, is equal to the integral of B dot N hat DA over the surface inside our path. So the path in this example up here would be a path around this rectangle. That would be our path. And this shaded area is the surface inside the path. Now this, this integral actually is actually essentially an EMF because we saw that it actually can drive currents. We saw currents in those coils, for example. Um, and there's, but I left out a really crucial piece here. So this is the time derivative here of this magnetic flux. And there's actually a minus sign here. That minus sign really has to do with directions, but it's so much easier to look at minus dB dt and get the direction and then worry about magnitudes um, that, that we'll usually do it that way. So we could actually rewrite this equation as EMF is equal to minus the rate of change of the magnetic flux. Now, this is an interesting kind of EMF because it's distributed around the entire wire, if you like. If we, if we think about the coil put in the region of where the, there was a time varying magnetic field, you got bigger and bigger currents the more loops of coil you had. So the, the EMF was distributed. This, this curly electric field went through the entire wire this non-Coulomb field. And so basically we had an EMF sort of stretched along this whole wire and the, the more loops we got, the bigger the EMF was. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's see if we can actually do an example here. Now how, and, and one thing to, to ask is, how would we actually get the magnitude of the electric field? And the answer is if you know the length of your path, then we can actually figure out, and, and we draw a circular path, which is usually the easiest thing to do. Then we can figure out the, uh, the electric field just by dividing the EMF by the length of the path. So let's take an example of a coil here with, some number of turns. So this is a coil. And we're going to move a magnet. And we need some dimensions. So the radius is 
three uh, centimeters. And the coil has 500 turns of wire here. And what we're going to do is we're going to move the magnet from very far away. So Kevin, are you asking about dropping the, uh, the magnet down the tube? Is that the experiment you're asking about? Yeah. Um, yes, if you had a, if you had a spring, you might get, you might get some slowing down and we'll see why having gaps in it are not as good as having a, a continuous tube. Um, So move the magnet from really far away to um, to close in uh, 0 0.3 seconds. <clears throat> OK. And um, we'll say that when the magnet is close, closest distance, then the magnetic field inside this coil here, um, the, mag the magnitude of the magnetic field is 0 0.2 Tesla. Um, so B is 0 0.2 Tesla when it's close, and magnetic field is approximately 0 when it's far away. So let's calculate an EMF. That's equal to for one loop, it would it would be uh, the final magnetic fit flux minus the initial magnetic flux over delta t. And since we have 500 loops, we're going to multiply by 500 loops. And we're going to assume something that isn't true, which is that, is that magnetic field is uniform. Um, inside the the coil, we we know that the magnetic field of a, of a dipole is diverges a little bit. So, but we're going to approximate that. Um, okay. So, so really the way. So the question. So Claire has a question about sine, and and I think really the way to think about this equation is actually to do that, <laughs> and just take absolute values of everything. Because the sign is a sort of an arcane right hand rule direction thing. Okay, so what does a negative EMF mean? It just it just has to do with the direction of the field. And we have a much better way of, of getting the direction of the field than worrying about that particular arcane thing, which I think is discussed in the book if you want to read about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to usually get the direction separately from the from the EMF. So right now we're gonna we'll just say it's gonna be we're gonna take absolute values of everything. Um, and so we'd have 500 times um, let's see. Uh, we're moving it, we're starting far away and moving close. So we start far away and move close. So this is going to be the magnetic flux. The final magnetic flux is going to be 0 0.2 Tesla times the area of the coil, which is going to be a pi times 0.03 meters, the quantity squared. So that's the, the final magnetic flux. And the initial magnetic flux is conveniently zero, the way we've set this up. And delta T is 0 0.3 seconds. And why 500? Because the, the area we calculate here is the area inside one loop, but there are 500 loops. And so we get this EMF distributed over all these loops. So we have to multiply by the number of loops. 
And when we get done, we find that we get a number which is going to be 9.4 times 10 to the minus 2 volts. <clears throat> And that can drive a current you saw from that 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 video. Okay. So here is a slightly tricky question to think about. Now, so we have a solenoid whose radius is two centimeters, and we have around it a ring um, whose radius is 10 centimeters. So this is two centimeters and this is 10 centimeters. And what happens is, um, and, and at the moment, nothing's changing, but we have uh, a current, a constant current flowing through the solenoid. So the magnetic field inside the solenoid has a magnitude of about half a Tesla. Now you may remember we did a V Python uh, model of a solenoid, or you looked at one just by using the Biot-Savart law and integrating around all the loops and whatnot. And we saw that the magnetic field made by this, this very tightly, it's just a long coil, really tightly round long coil. Um, the magnetic field inside it was very uniform and very large, and the magnetic field outside was almost zero. And the better the solenoid is, the, the closer that is to true. So what we've got is a magnetic field that's, um, that's uh, non-zero inside the solenoid and zero outside the solenoid, but we wanna know the flux through this big outer ring. So if we look at it end on, what we've got is the outer ring and then the solenoid. So in here, there's a non-zero magnetic field and out there, out there, there, there is. Uh, so in here, out here, B is approximately zero and in here, B is not zero. And so to, the question is, is the magnetic flux Am I going to multiply by 0.5 Tesla times pi times 0.02 meters squared? Or am I going to multiply 0.5 Tesla times pi times 0.1 meter squared? So let's think about what the answer is here. So the definition of flux is that it's the perpendicular component of the magnetic field times the, the surface area over which that field is measured. And so to add it up, what we'd have to do is we'd have to, we'd have to get the flux in here, fly inside, and then we'd have to get the flux in this outer region and add them. And that's actually easy because since the magnetic field in all this outer region is zero, that's zero. And so the only non-zero contribution to the flux is actually going to be this field inside the solenoid. So in fact, this is the right answer. And yet we still actually, if this field were changing, now here it's not changing, so we don't have a curly electric field. But if it were changing, we would find that there really was an electric field out here. So this is a little interesting and slightly magical. <clears throat> okay, I wanna come back to where we started with this falling ring. We'll, we will calculate some flux. We'll practice this in recitation, okay? But I want to come back to the um, the magnet in the tube. Okay. So we're so there's there's a 
we have 10 minutes and we can do this, but we have to be a little quick. I want to reason through what's happening when the magnet's falling through the tube. So here's a bar magnet falling through a long aluminum or copper tube. And what we're going to consider is this, this circular path around the tube um, in a, at, a, at a location above the falling magnet, OK? And so the question is, in, on this surface here, as the magnet falls, what is the direction of minus dB dt? We're going to see that where we're going to get to is we're going to see that we're actually induced. This electric field is going to be driving currents in the tube. The currents in the tube themselves make magnetic fields because they're circular loop current loops, so they're dipoles. And so essentially the tube turns into a bunch of dipole magnets that can interact with the falling magnet and either repel it or attract it. Now we're going to guess that it repels the magnet. We're going to slow it down because that's what we saw, but we have to, we have to see if that makes sense. So that's where we're going with this. <clears throat> so first of all, um, what is the direction of <clears throat> minus dB dt? Now be careful. The magnetic field up here, the south end is closer. So the magnetic field is going to be pointing into the magnet. You want to consider two times when the magnet is there and when it's just a little bit farther down the tube. Now, you may be getting the idea, since we've had several of these questions, that this is something you need to be able to do. This is right. This is something you need to be able to do. OK, basically, the answer is not good enough. You really do have to practice this because you need to know how to do this. All right. So the majority, by a small amount, voted for two. So let's see what's right. <clears throat> so the magnetic field up here is going to be pointing down toward the bar magnet. So you need to know that. So initially, we have a magnetic field pointing down. As the magnet gets farther away, the field gets smaller. So we have a smaller magnetic field. Therefore, we're going to have uh, delta B is up, and therefore, a minus delta B over delta T is actually in the minus Y direction. So that's right. <clears throat> OK, so if so, everybody get out your right hand and point your thumb in the minus y direction in the direction of uh, minus dB dt, OK? So point your thumb down, curl your fingers around. That's the direction of the electric field along this circle we drew here. So we're going to have an electric field curling around that way, which drives a conventional current that way too. So now we have this conventional current going clockwise, I guess you'd say. Um, well, so here's our clockwise conventional current. So here's our circle. Um, we have conventional current going this way. And so that's that itself is a magnetic dipole, right? So what's the direction of the magnetic field made by that magnetic dipole? Well, let's see. We'll figure out the magnetic field at the center here due to this dipole. So here's our R, IDL cross R. So it looks like it's making a magnetic field um, that's actually down. So let's call this B induced. So this is um, 
this was the magnetic field of the, the magnet. But there's also this induced magnetic field. This is a different field due to this no, new current, B induced. Um, okay, so that actually, if this current loop was actually a bar magnet, We know the magnetic field points out of the the north end, so it looks it. So this looks like a a, uh, a, med, a a bar magnet with its north end down. Well, what happens when you put the north end of a magnet near the south end of a magnet? They attract, right? And so actually we get this, we get this magnetic force upward as this new dipole we've created here actually attracts our bar magnet and slows it down. Now you can work, you can work it out for yourself and satisfy yourself that actually, if we look at the bottom, this, this loop here at the bottom, um, that the current is going to run in such a way that it makes a magnetic dipole that looks like its north pole is up and it will actually also repel the falling magnet and so it'll slow it down even more and you can work that out for yourself. Okay. So we actually have a new a new physical phenomenon. Um, and we see that there's that a time varying magnetic field actually can is associated with a an electric field in a region, a curly electric field in a region, um, even though there are no charges that are sitting around making that field. Um, and we will practice with that this afternoon. So in chat. <clears throat> What was important and what do you need to think about or work on? Okay, if, if you're having trouble with it, with this minus dBdt direction thing, think about what your questions are so that you can actually ask them in recitation. Dr. Shabai, could you clarify something? Can you go up where um, we did the first problem of the direction? It was like the third thing we did, I think. Yeah, those. Yeah. How come in the first one, um, the delta B is down, but then in the other one, it's in the separate way. Could you clarify the di direction real quick, please? Yeah, so um, you have to think about, so we have these two discrete times, right? Time one and time two. Right. You have to think about both the direction and the magnitude of the magnetic field at the observation location at those times. And so at this time, the at time one, the the magnet is some distance away from the origin, and the magnetic field points down because this is the south pole of the magnet that's closest. Right. Now here in time two, the magnet is closer. And that means that the magnitude of the direction of the field is still the same, but the, the field got bigger, right? Right. Okay, so what, now what we have to do is we want delta B is, is B2 minus B1. So we have to draw those vectors tail to tail to subtract them. Now that's a little awkward because they're, they're along the same line, so we just have to offset them a little bit. So we draw them more or less tail to tail like this. Mm -hmm. And then we say, well, what's, you know, what's, what's delta B? Well, it's B2 minus B1. So what does that mean? We draw an arrow from the, from the initial location to the final location. So delta B is going to be that vector. And you can also think of it as B1 plus delta B is equal to B2, right? So what do you right. have? So we got we got delta B going down. 
And so therefore it's in the minus y direction. Now we didn't, in this first question, we didn't ask you about minus dB dt. We just asked for delta B. Okay. Right. We'd, okay. If we'd asked for minus dB dt, then that would actually be in the positive y. y. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then in the second one, oh, it's because the, the magnet was flipped and that's why. Okay. Because the magnet got farther away. Right? right. And so therefore the magnitude of the field decreased. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's just, you really just have to work through all the steps. There's, there weren't, there aren't any shortcuts. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> okay. All right. See you this afternoon. See you later.